All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Research Innovation Spotlight on Immunology. Um, this is brought to you by the Alliance for Southern California Innovation and Bioscience LA and generously sponsored by Alexandria Venture Investments and we appreciate their support for this uh, great series which uh, the objective is to connect innovators with industry to discuss possible future collaborations and uh, build relationships and that's what we really hope to come from this uh, session today where um, you'll hear some amazing presentations as well as hopefully have great questions and um, and feedback and you know provide insights into maybe what some stuff you're working on in, in your in your other labs or other you know um, uh, things you're looking at and see if we can you know get some great discussion going on here as well it's not purely just a, a plenary session so um, i am steve gillison from the alliance for southern california innovation i help run this program i'm joined by dave whalen at bioscience la um, our moderator today is julia de sylvester um, she's managing director at wave edge capital and um, what i like to do and we have of course four great academic presentations and i will just briefly briefly introduce them but then i want to have everyone else in the room introduce themselves to uh, let everyone know who's in the room. And uh, so uh, our uh, presenters today, um, uh, we have Tom Lane, who's the Chancellor's Professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at UC Irvine. And he'll be discussing COVID-19 in the central nervous system, implications for long haul syndrome. Although he might have a better title than I just gave, I might be changing that. That's um, okay. <laughs> great. Uh, we have uh, Adam Godzik, Professor of Biomedical Sciences, the Bruce D. and Nancy B. Varner Presidential Endowed Chair in Cancer Research at the UCR School of Medicine. And he'll be talking about using single cell RNA seek to identify dynamic protein targets for pharmaceutical intervention in patients with sepsis. Uh, we'll have Nicole Steinmetz. She's the Professor of Nanoengineering and Director of the Center for Nanoimmunoengineering uh, at UC San Diego. And Bob, I have probably truncated some of your titles, but you all have very many great credentials and wonderful things. If you want to expand on them, please do feel free when you get to, to your turn. And uh, of course, Wei-An Zhao, um, Associate Professor at the Sioux and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center, Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UC Irvine. He's also the scientific co-founder of Arvedas Biosciences, a startup um, as well. So that's great. Um, and he's going to talk about, oh, I've heard the uh, uh, sorry, uh, Nicole will talk about repurposed plant virus based immunotherapy for the local treatment of, meta of metastatic disease. And Wayan is going to talk about imaging based companion diagnostics for the stratification of patients with solid tumors to promote new and existing immuno oncology drugs. And of course, we are joined today by AJ Nerula, who is the VP of Immunology for Eli Lilly. And we all and we'll talk, we'll hear from him throughout, as well as at the end panel, where all the uh, presenters and AJ will end will be in a discussion uh, with uh, moderated by Julie Esta. So, um, Dave Whalen can uh, actually. Um, I'm going to go first through sorry the uh, introductions for the, of the who's else in the room, and then we'll get to um, Dave and, and Julie Esta at that point. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go through my little uh, Brady Bunch uh, windows here, and uh, Sue from the Alliance want to say hi. Oh, you're on mute, Sue, or your mic's not working. There oh, sorry, I have two mute buttons. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Sula Chance, and I am the Corporate Engagement Lead for the Alliance, and um, welcome all of you. Okay, thanks. Um, Farnaz? Hi, everyone. I'm Farnaz Farzan. I'm uh, President and Founder of Farzan Oncogen Consulting, and it's a pleasure to be here and meeting everyone. Okay, thank you. And Dave, David Charles Pearson. Hi, uh, David Pearson from UC Riverside. I'm responsible for the entrepreneurial programming and incubators at the university. Great. Uh, Gazelle, good to see you again. How are you? Uh, good to see you again, too. I'm Gazelle Rastigar. Um, I'm with Scopus Advisory Group, as well as uh, a new venture in food tech. Uh, to be on that later. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Jessica, George. Hi, Jessica Droge. I head up the search and evaluation group uh, within business development at Amgen. So happy to be here. Thank you. Andy. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andy Wilson. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Southern California Innovation and pleased to have you all here. And this is part of our portfolio of kind of engagement opportunities to really elevate and super connect uh, Southern California. And, this topic's near and dear to my heart because Saturday I both had both my Moderna booster and my flu shot. Um, so now that I'm at the point of no return, I want to uh, understand what I did to my body and why it was a good decision. <laughs> good. Uh, Dave Meyer. 
So I'm from UC Irvine, uh, Managing Director of the Research Translation Group, which manages, uh, assists with faculty engagement, uh, intellectual property capture and prosecution and licensing into startup companies and existing companies. Fantastic. Hallie, good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vice President of Science and Technology at Alexandria Real Estate Equities um, and our Alexandria Venture Investments, our corporate um, venture arm. I oversee all of our investments for Southern California. Great, thanks. And uh, King, Lou? Yeah, Ching. Hi, I'm Ching. Ching. I'm the director at Translational Development Center at City of Hope. I'm also a co-founder of AccuraSTEM. And Translational Development Center basically help startups at City of Hope and also elsewhere to translate their research into clinical trials, focusing on cell and gene therapy. Okay, great to see you. I remember AccuraSTEM from the first look showcase, I believe you guys were there. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Sonia, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Sonia Maram Satayesh, and I um, do precision oncology research at the Michelson Center Convergent Bioscience CSI Cancer. Oh, great. Welcome. Uh, Mark Paris. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Paris. I lead oncology research and evaluation as part of global business development at Daiichi Sankyo. Happy to be here. Great. Thank you. And actually, it uh, looks like Walter David is logging on. Let's see if he connects to audio in time. Perfect timing, Walter David. Hi, uh, good morning. We're just doing introductions if you don't mind uh, start saying hi. Maybe he hasn't quite gotten the uh, audio working. Right, we can come back to Walter. Um, oh, anyway, so oh, let's- Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I just joined, I apologize. Oh, no <laughs> just catching up. Uh, I'm only on my first cup of coffee, so hopefully everyone understands. Uh, Walter <laughs> David, Director of Research Business Development at City of Hope. Uh, and I basically kind of, uh, uh, you know, interface with industry to out license our efforts, uh, search and evaluation. We have a uh, internal venture arm, which we basically invest in City of Hope Innovation. And I'm very happy to be here and meet everyone. And I'll put my camera on soon. So uh, really excited to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dave, why don't you go ahead and introduce our moderator of the day and, uh, and tell us about Bioscience LA. Perfect. Well, great, great to see everyone. Some uh, familiar faces, some uh, some new faces. So uh, always great to, to bring this group together. Thanks, uh, Steve, for having us. And uh, thank you, Hallie and Alexandria, for making it all possible. Uh, I'm Dave Whalen, the CEO of Bioscience LA. We are uh, helping to grow the life sciences ecosystem in the LA region uh, through uh, through growing funding, growing space, growing talent, and and I think most importantly, growing awareness through messaging and connectivity. And so, if we haven't met before, uh, uh, looking forward to finding ways that we can support work, whether you're here in LA or uh, outside of LA, but uh, trying to make new new connections uh, to LA. Um, and uh, I know a few of you, uh, Andy and uh, uh, Gazelle. Uh, and Jessica have been to our new uh, collaboration space in uh, in Culver City. Uh, but uh, for those of you and and Nas, you have as well. So um, so uh, we got a good good group who've been here. But that means a lot of people who've not come by. So would love to see you uh, check out our space, have a meeting here, and uh, uh, and connect. Walter, you've got to make it over here at some point. So there. Now that I can see your face, I can call you out. <laughs> Um, and very, very excited to, uh, to have uh, today's topic and to have uh, uh, Julia Esther Sylvester uh, on board. I, she and I met actually in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, a few years ago through, uh, I, I think, uh, right, when, uh, right when you had come back from the UK and were living in San Diego and kind of uh, getting reconnected. So, uh, um, you know, you've got the LA connection, we both have a London connection, and you've got just an incredible background where... Uh, you've done, you know, had research uh, research gigs with University of Chicago and, and MIT, uh, uh, Scripps Research Institute, uh, PhD in uh, in biochemistry and molecular biology from University of Chicago, and uh, Julia, I you I know you've had a lot of experience in today's topic, uh, far more than Steve and I, which is uh, we're we're thrilled to have you on board to kind of help guide the conversation. Um, uh, you you've also had to stand as uh, investor of uh, investor relations for the Gary Michelson Medical Research Foundation, uh, someone who's uh, near and dear to us here in, in Los Angeles. And 
Uh, most recently uh, moved into the, the investment space uh, as managing director at Woodside Capital Partners, and then very recently uh, managing director of Wave Edge Capital. So you're based in San Diego, working with us in Los Angeles, working with firms in the Bay Area and kind of connecting the dots across the country and around the world. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you to you know, share a little bit more about your background, but really dive into the, the conversations today. So thank you, Julia. Thanks for bringing us together, Steve and, and David. Uh, I think we depend on connectors like you. Uh, one of the things that I like so much about today's um, group is that we have um, the, the strategics uh, represented by Amgen, City of Hope, Daiichi, um, and Alexandria, and very uh, Alexandria, although being maybe perhaps more of a financial uh, investor. Uh, categorization, um, but it's it's not very common to bring together strategics in in my new world of M and A to bring together strategics and early academics. Um, so often we see venture and early academics, or strategics and companies that are already commercially proven, uh, de-risked in terms of regulation. Uh, but to bring together those those two groups uh, through. The Alliance for SoCal Innovation and Bioscience LA is, is pretty special. Um, and to have such an intimate group as well so that we can have some really interesting conversations. I'm joined by AJ Narula here, who is um, VP of Immunology at Eli Lilly. And he'll be um, weighing in on some of the broader topics and how he sees, you know, he's very close to the developments in the field. And so it will be very interesting to, to get his perspective on how these uh, particular topics weigh out in, in terms of uh, a big pharma company. Thanks for being here, AJ. Would you like to take a moment to tell us a bit about, uh, about yourself and, and what brings you here today? Yeah, um, hi everyone, good morning. Um, a pleasure to be here today. So I'm AJ Narula. I am the uh, therapeutic area head for immunology for Eli Lilly. And I'm also the site head at the uh, Lilly Biotechnology Center here in San Diego. Um, my background is as an immunologist and rheumatologist um, and really looking forward to the uh, discussions today. There are some, when you look at, at the different um, titles or different topics from, from each professor here, um, they may seem, they're broadly organized around the immune system, um, maybe so, some parts of the CNS, uh, certainly molecular engineering, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, but what I see is a, a, a sort of stream throughout, an intellectual stream throughout, is looking at molecular switches within a system's context, how to manipulate the system, how to use the system uh, to better understand the dynamics, uh, so no longer looking at it as a static uh, snapshot of molecular interactions, but a dynamic landscape, um, and recognizing that we can use uh, naturally existing elements to completely modulate the system to our advantage, which would be hopefully <laughs> towards health uh, and away from, from disorder. Uh, so we'll start with, um, with Tom Lane, who is at uh, UC Irvine. He's Chancellor's Professor in the part Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. And what I, what I particularly like is, is that this is on trend with COVID and Alzheimer's and will help us understand some of the connection between those two disorders in molecular terms. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Julia. I'd also like to thank the organizers for uh, providing this opportunity. It seems like a very exciting um, uh, forum. And so I'm very happy to participate. Uh, so can everybody see my screen right now? Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Perfect. I'm going to go through. I'm going to take, I think it's six minutes. So I'm going to um, stay on time. All right. Um, I did change the title of my talk. And um, what I am focusing on now is uh, there's some very, very recent work, but I'm kind of very intrigued by it. It's uh, um, can targeting of a transcription factor NFR or NRF2 be a strategy against COVID? And um, I'm taking advantage, if I can just take one quick aside, my laboratory has for over two decades been doing coronavirus research um, and look, in particular looking at the consequences of coronavirus infection of the central nervous system, molecular mechanisms governing um, neuroinflammation, 
um, as well as um, participating in chronic neurodegenerative disease. Um, so I now I can't go to a party and have a nuanced conversation about spike glycoprotein and um, et cetera, et cetera, whereas before nobody heard about coronaviruses. So uh, there are three big new areas of work that we've been doing in our lab for the past year and a half. One is evaluate effects of antiviral drugs in reducing viral replication in uh, lungs and then also the brain. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And we do in vitro analysis using human lung, lung epithelial cells as well as human neurons. And then we often move forward into um, in vivo studies using SARS-2 infection of susceptible uh, strains of mice. But in addition, we're doing some other studies because we're very intrigued about comorbidities and um, uh, neuropathology associated with SARS-2 infection and particularly Alzheimer's disease because there's a clear literature highlighting that um, demented patients that are exposed to COVID often have exacerbation of symptoms. So we're currently infecting Alzheimer's disease mouse models with SARS-2 and then evaluating how this inflammatory effect in the lungs may accelerate um, AD pathology. We also have acquired post-mortem tissues from uh, patients that have been diagnosed that to have AD or Alzheimer's disease and then died of COVID. And so we're looking to see if there's increased penetrance of the uh, virus in the brain of these patients and then also increase AD pathology. And then finally, we're very interested in long COVID. It's a very significant problem. Um, any, you can read um, the, the numbers of people that have long COVID uh, vary depending on the article you read. Roughly 10% of COVID patients develop these chronic symptoms uh, following their initial exposure to the virus. And one of the key neurologic features, as probably many of you know, is this brain fog or really cognition issues that also correlate with fatigue. And so we're working to build some very interesting mouse models where we can uh, grasp um, memory consolidation and other cognitive function in animals following infection. Um, so as you're probably now very well aware, unlike SARS-1, which came out in 2002, and then MERS-CoV, which uh, came out in 2012, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-2 um, has a wide ranging effect on a number of different organ systems in the body. But in particular, neurologic symptoms are very common and these vary in severity. And this can range from a loss of sense of taste and smell, which sounds um, benign, but it's very disorienting if you have it. Um, then it can accelerate in severity with brain fog or cognition, dizziness and headaches, stroke, seizure, inflammation of the brain, and specifically encephalitis and meningitis. And in fact, you can even, uh, there are reports of uh, myelin loss or demyelination in these patients. And when um, in early 2020, everybody, including ourselves, were really intrigued whether because of these neurologic symptoms that were appearing in the clinical literature, does the virus have um, access to the central nervous system, particularly since it's a respiratory pathogen? And if you inhale it in your nose, can you go up into the olfactory bulb and replicate in uh, mitral layer or glomerular layer neurons, for example? And surprisingly, um, you know, there's a variation, there's varied reports on the penetrance of, vi of the virus in the central nervous system. Uh, the images I'm showing here were from a paper from um, Akika Iwasaki's laboratory. Um, it came out in 2020. And it was first on bioarchives and it came out on Jake's Med. But they, they found viral RNA um, and, and protein in neurons, which other people have reported, including ourselves. And then also, if you look in the CSF or take just tissue sections and do um, RT PCR, so in other words, looking for viral RNA, you can see a greater percentage of people that the virus might be there, but still, it's not an overwhelming effect. There are, however, neuropathological features, right? So you see microglial activation. So microglia are the, like the resident immune cell of the central nervous system. Clearly, there's um, lymphocyte infiltration as well as uh, ischemic changes in astrogliosis. So it almost looks like the virus has visited the brain and then it's, it's either been controlled or it might be subdued to so, so low levels that it's very challenging to detect. So um, we took advantage of the fact, again, that we've been doing uh, an enormous amount of work in looking at susceptibility of a variety of different um, uh, resident cell lines or cells to infection with murine coronavirus. So it was a very easy extension to start doing this work in the BSL-3. So in collaboration with um, Leslie Thompson here at UC Irvine, she provided us um, iPSC-derived human neurons. And what we did was simply just look at the ability of the virus to infect and replicate in these cells. And indeed, we're using MAP2, so these are just um, immunofluorescent images where you can see neurons uninfected by 24 hours post-infection using a multiplicity of infection of 0.1. Um, you can start seeing viral antigen. This is a stain for the nucleocapsid protein of the virus. 
by 48 hours, you can really see the virus is growing. And what's interesting about these, the, the, these data is as follows. One of the things, if you take a mouse neuroadapted coronavirus and put it in mouse neurons, the virus grows beautifully, but you start seeing fusion of the cells together. We don't see that here. And, and you, if you look at these high power images, you can see viral antigen at 24 hours in the cell body, but it's not really extending down these um, dendrites, if you will. But by 48 hours later, the virus is clearly going down. And you can actually quantitate this by just counting the number of infected cells while also doing plaque assay. So I think the virus clearly can replicate in neurons. This is nothing new, but I think the way it spreads in neurons is very interesting. And also we've done RNA, um, um, bulk RNA sequencing. And our findings were kind of consistent with what some other people have found that there is a response by these neurons that are infected, but it's not as much as I would have anticipated. We see this very muted inflammatory response as well as activation of antiviral response genes. And in, in fact, um, another paper comparing infection of neurons with SARS-CoV-2 with Zika virus reported the exact same thing that um, you really see this muted or dampened inflammatory antiviral response in neurons infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then we did ingenuity pathway analysis. And one of the things that came up was this new coronavirus pathogenesis pathway. And it's, it's dramatically elevated in infected neurons. So now I'm gonna take a um, left turn. And so we were doing this studies and Leslie Tom and Thompson has been a great friend of mine uh, for close to 20 years. And she and her uh, uh, colleague, Malcolm Castall, who's a project scientist in the lab, um, reached out to me because Leslie's work is in um, uh, Huntington's disease. And I was just talking one day about the work we were doing. And she mentioned that they had an interesting drug in their laboratory. And um, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. This is a paper that was published in Cell Chemical Biology in 2016. And what this article did is it, it identified this drug, MIND417, all right? And what this does is it is a very powerful inducer of NRF2 activation, specifically in neurons. And this correlates with um, reduced production of reactive oxygen species and the nitrogen intermediates. And she contacted me because there was an emerging um, story in the literature that suggested that um, targeting NRF2 may be a potent way to suppress viral replication. And the evidence for this is, and this is this, not this paper, but others, that you see um, reduction in NRF2 pathways in um, lungs of uh, patients that uh, succumb to COVID, all right? So in other words, the virus is trying to block, block that, highlighting the fact that if the virus wants to block that, that means it doesn't want it to be expressed. And indeed, if you treat SARS-infected cells or SARS-2-infected cells with NRF2 and agonists, such as DMF or dimethyl fumarate, it blocks viral replication, okay? So that led to the very easy question. Uh, Leslie said, do you mind trying um, uh, this MIND417, which specifically targets NRF2 much more with much greater specificity in dimethyl fumarate, which is an FDA-approved drug for um, a variety of inflammatory diseases, including uh, multiple sclerosis, and to see if it has any effect in the CNS or in, in, in infected neurons or lung cells. So very quickly, um, NRF2, it's a transcription factor. It's encoded by the NFL or NFE2L2 gene. It participates in a variety of biologic functions and has pleiotropic roles in, in regulating metabolism, inflammation, autophagy, mitochondrial physiology, as well as immune responses. And then more recently, um, there's compelling evidence that NRF2 activation is associated with blocking viral replication, particularly human viral pathogens, including HSV1 and 2, Zika virus, uh, vaccinia, and SARS-CoV-2. So it's a range of viruses, DNA viruses and RNA viruses, right? That the mechanism by which, the, by which this activation pathway um, elicits these antiviral responses has not been well characterized. So um, just one quick aside and I'll show you some data. We had a paper that came out using our mouse neurotropic infection uh, or a mouse coronavirus infecting um, the brains of mice and we did single cell RNA uh, sequencing analysis. And indeed, we see a dramatic increase in NRF2 in a variety of different immune cell populations present in the, in the brain. So in other words, the murine coronavirus we use is a beta coronavirus, which is in the same subfamily as um, SARS-CoV-2. 
So you can actually use this as somewhat of a surrogate model for measuring different types of immune responses that occur in, in following reflection. So this was interesting, and this is why I kind of agreed to do this with Leslie. Okay, I'm like, this, this could be something intriguing. And indeed it, it is. So it's preliminary data, but we, we're really moving forward. And the model system is very simple. We take either lung epithelial cells, which is a, it's a cell line called CALU3, which is very well used in the uh, studying antivirals in SARS-CoV-2. And then we also use the human IPC-derived neurons. We infected them with a, a low multiplicity of infection, allowed the infection to go for an hour, and then treated with mind force 17 and took then um, virus at defined times post-infection. And what I'm showing here is viral RNA in the um, IPSC-derived neurons at 24 and 48 hours. And the mind force 17 just did a great job. And moreover, um, um, the cells just look a little bit better. I don't know how to describe it. If you take supernatants from the neurons and do a plaque assay, we also saw a reduction in viral, uh, viral replication. And the same was true with um, the human lung epithelial cells. The big difference here was that the, the virus really loves replicating in these cells and can cause a lot of cytopathology, but the MIND4 really protected it. So um, we're, we're really anxious to move forward. And then we also did RNA sequencing analysis. And I think this is the really intriguing aspect in, in, that we have an insight into a potential mechanism by which this MIND417 works. And that is it disrupts the tubulin network, all right? And tubulins regulate COVID-19 assembly. They, this is required for viral assembly and release of viral particles. And as I indicated, this RNA seq analysis we did indicating that this really is important disrupting the tubulin pathway in both um, um, uh, the CALA3 lung epithelial cells, and then we're also looking at this pathway in neurons. And this is also nothing, the tubulin pathway is, in, is very well documented to be important for replication of coronaviruses. This is an example of a paper that came out in 2016 um, highlighting this. And what it does is it, it basically tubulins, as you know, are highways for the cell and viruses basically have to build themselves. So proteins have to be transported through the cell and then the, like a car it has to be built, right? So finally, we've got an, um, a variety of different uh, mouse models of SARS-CoV-2. In fact, we're building a really good, I think will be a very important transgenic, better transgenic mouse model right now. But what we can do with the standard models, we can do an intranasal inoculation with the virus. We can take brains out and lungs out at different times post-infection. This is just Really nice in C2 hybridization, we've done to show that the virus really gets into the brains of these K18 mice and also in the lungs, right? So in other words, we can exploit these to look at how antivirals may um, get into the central nervous system and, and dampen infection and replication as well as in the lungs. So um, human neurons and lungs are susceptible to infection by SARS-CoV-2, and these cells do a very nice job of replicating the virus. Um, whoops, my N4 is specific to NRF, uh, <laughs> NRF2. This is what happens when you get up and try to change your talk at the last minute. And then targeting this pathway via treatment of cells with, with MIND417 impedes efficient replication in these cell types, the neurons and the lungs. And moreover, we believe that this is dependent on a unique tubulin pathway. So in other words, we have a mechanism. I should also point out that MIND417 is CNS penetrant. So we're now affecting how treatment of mouse infected, in SARS-2 infected mice can, um, with MIND417 can affect um, both neuropathology as well as lungs. And then finally, um, this is just um, acknowledgements and I definitely have to acknowledge my uh, funding support. And Hema, Susanna and Yuting, who are my three graduate students who work tirelessly in the BSL-3 because it is not trivial. It takes a lot of work and time and I will stop there. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm taken back to some of my early work with um, intellectual property transfer across academia and um, and pharma, and um, and wondering if you have yet had any interactions with with big pharma on this topic, and if you can tell me if this mechanism is significantly different from the I believe the antivirals that are being uh, developed by Pfizer and Merck at the moment. Well, I don't think that, so I'll answer your first question. No, we have not been approached. Um, secondly, just um, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and just enter NRF2 and COVID-19, nothing's coming up. So it doesn't seem to be a pathway that um, has been targeted. Um, uh, there are academic labs looking at this, but I don't think in great detail. Um, the other antiviral drugs, to my knowledge, are not act, you know, targeting 
this antioxidant pathway. And the other thing that NRF2, when it's activated, what it does is it also dampens inflammation, right? And so, um, but the tubulin uh, uh, pathway is unique, right? And I think that's, that's, that, that could be a nice corner of the sandbox, um, in my opinion. AJ, can you help uh, comment on any yeah. of, of, of the, this particular topic in the context of Eli Lilly? Yeah, I have a fair bit to say about it, actually, and a really a fascinating um, talk, Tom. I'll make a couple of comments and ask a question, probably reveal some of my, my personal biases. But, but um, you know, many years ago, I worked on the development of Tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate at Biogen. Yeah. And it was always uh, challenging trying to tease out the uh, mechanism of action of, of the molecule, um, you, you know, beyond the direct effects of dimethyl fumarate, fumarate on the TCA cycle to the activation of NRF2. So um, what you presented today is a really fascinating information about direct infections of neurons with, with, with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I mean, right, right now, actually, Lily is in a partnership with a biotech in the UK founded by Luke O'Neill, really mm -hmm. looking at some of these critical um, pathways in um, immunometabolism, if you will. If you will. But, but I mean, th this really uh, sort of fascinating new insight you provided about a direct pathology mediate, you know, mediate, mediated by SARS-CoV-2 on NRF2. Um, it's very new and exciting. Um, to what extent um, you know, can you tease out the fact that the compound you evaluated is impacting some of the immunometabolism of the cells as, as dimethyl fumarate does or itaconate would, for example? Is there any way to tease that out? We're doing it right now. Uh, you know, like I said, we just started this, and these are great questions. And you know, I kind of backed into this because it was Le Leslie and her colleagues and team were really the ones that have done a ton of this work. On uh, their goal is in Huntington's disease, right? And so uh, Leslie has developed some great mouse models, and they're starting in that approach right now. And I think you know what I wanted to do, and what we're going to do is we could do the in vitro work. Um, but I, I want to go straight into the mice, right? Because that's that's where I'm much more comfortable, right? Because when then we can flow sort out immune cells, we can do single cell RNA seq on these immune cells and really start addressing some of the questions that you're asking. So this this project is really in its infancy, but I'm really, I'm, you know, we're really pivoting right now because I think it could be very intriguing. And I don't mean to be hand waving, but it's just, you know, we just starting to do it right now. Well, it's fascinating. And obviously with many patients out there with long COVID now, you know, you sort of think about what can we do to... <laughs> get some therapeutics to them quickly. And, and probably, you know, it's hard to go into too many specifics here, but be interesting, you know, to what extent the, the compound you're evaluating is CNS penetrant. And also, is there a role for evaluating proof of concept with with something like dimethyl fumarate in, in long, long COVID, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of neurologists that run clinics. They're now, almost every major medical school in the country has a long COVID clinic, right? And, yeah. you know, and basically you're just, you're, it's maintenance, right? There's no interventional therapies. And, and I think, I think we're still trying to understand what long COVID is, right? And, um, you know, I'm just having done coronavirus research for so long, it is particularly with neurotropic viruses, you know, they, you know, viruses, you know, they're sneaky, right? They can, they can, and the CNS is a great place to hang out, right? And um, the fact that there's not over virus present in the CNS doesn't mean it's not there or it's been there and does damage, right? There's the, really compelling articles for that. So, you know, I think there's a lot of great questions to ask, right? But, you know, we have preliminary data now that, you know, for these demented patients that died and got diagnosed with COVID that had Alzheimer's uh, upon neuropathology, we are detecting viral RNA and antigen in their olfactory balls, which I think is very interesting. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more, and we're trying now to see if they've, you know, increased in amyloid beta, tau, phosphorylation, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what side of the fence you want to play on. <laughs> for that. No, it's fascinating. And in the spirit of making connections, I mean, we, we're so close together that it'd be fun to chat about some of this in the, in the future. But uh, right. and, and the, the connections with sort of chronic ne neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's um, and yeah. Huntington's is fascinating. So uh, thanks for a great talk. I'll, I'll open it up to others, I guess. For Thank comments. you very much for your kind words. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. So um, a great podcast. So since MDF is the first line of uh, treatment for relapse and remitting um, MS targeting NRF2, and now I actually worked for Atara for a while and designed an MS trial for them. So we know that um, MS is contributed significantly by Epstein Barr virus attacking the B cells that migrate and accumulate against this myelin, um, you know, around the axons and causing the demyelination. 
And now their studies are coming out that there is a direct correlation between activity of SARS and EBV. Have you guys looked at the Epstein-Barr virus load in your patients to see maybe there is a collaboration of also SARS with Epstein-Barr virus uh, contributing to the symptoms that you're seeing? Because um, in your study, you're showing also myelin is being affected. And so there, I, I wonder if there is some kind of a contribution of um, SARS also aggravating already the Epstein yeah. virus status. So, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I'd say the major focus of my lab until 2020 was using mouse coronavirus as a model for MS, right? That's, you know, I was originally the founding director for the MS Research Center here. And I'm not a clinician, I'm a, I'm a PhD. Um, and so I'm following the EBV field. I've done it for over two decades, right? And it kind of, there's an ebb and flow to it, right? And uh, now it's very, it's back again. It's very in the, the radar. And um, I'm not aware, I, I think it's a very compelling story, right? Particularly the B cell component, right? And how it impacts, you know, B cells. They're clearly, you know, Steve, Steve Hauser at UCSF and Peter Calabrese at Hopkins really have shown that, you know, anti-CD20 is a great, you know, therapeutic intervention, right? Um, Right now, after while the next person speaks and I'm listening, I'm going to do a lit search on EBV and COVID. You know, so is it? You know, so the idea is, if you're infected, you see an, an acceleration of EBV, or because you know, it can go dormant, right? So I don't know. I don't know. Now the demyelination, that's in a, a handful of studies from good laboratories, good neuropathology laboratories that have looked in these patients. What's interesting, and this highlights the deficiencies in mouse models, is. Um, if you looked at in detail at those brain sections from the mice, the virus avoids the myelin tract completely. Now that doesn't mean that that um, that you can't have demyelination, but we see no demyelination either in the brain, the brainstem, or the spinal cord. So um, who knows? You know, if you look at papers by Eric Song and Chris Bartley at UC San Francisco, they have really compelling data that you're seeing autoreactive antibodies that are in the CSF of patients. And so maybe you're getting a misguided attack against myelin antigens and that could be driving some of the pathology you're seeing, you know, but these are all great questions. This is, I, this is being very helpful. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, EBV is a very interesting virus to raise here because as, as I've been chatting or with clinicians who, uh, who are, you know, Deep in the deep in the throes of long COVID research, you know, clinically it has a bit of the same flavor as uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, oh, exactly. or chronic chronic uh, um, lupus with neuropsychiatric involvement, and uh, clearly EBV pathology has been implicated um, in some of those some of those diseases. So some of the, these viral connections to sort of evolution of a chronic autoimmune disease are pretty interesting. But you don't see, you know, you do see a drop in lymphocytes during the acute phase, but you're not seeing like, for example, on like Tisabre or other, I mean, like truly, you know, immunosuppressant drugs, you're not seeing the emergence of, you know, you're not getting PML, for example, right? You know, so it's not dramatically immunosuppressive. So anyway. Yep. Fascinating. And uh, now I'll call on Adam Godzik, who is professor of biomedical <laughs> sciences at um, at UC Irvine, I'm sorry, UC Riverside School of Medicine. And he'll be talking a bit about sepsis, which again is a um, disorder that can be caused by bacterial and viral infection, uh, very undefined in its molecular terms, um, very dynamic as a disease also in its molecular terms. Uh, and so here we'll be talking about hopefully a, a protein target that can be used to modify and modulate the, the disorder. Okay, thank you very much. So I also changed my title just to reflect the fact that we're still very early on this this um, this whole path this whole path here this whole journey. And I would like to start by introducing my team or our team. Uh, so I'm the half of the team. The first half, which was actually supposed to talk today, was Spira Nair. Uh, he's the immunologist. I'm a physicist, so I'm I'm doing it also to deflect some of the questions I may be getting because uh, because you know I hang around immunologists and I pick up some language, but I'm not one. So uh, if if there would be a question, I wouldn't know what to answer. I would just just say, well, wait for Mira to come back and answer this. Uh, so basically, she started with with a question. I, I followed with tools and analysis. She's doing the sample collection and single cell sequencing. We're doing our data analysis and process simulation. We also do it because, because we have close collaboration with RUHS uh, Hospital in, uh, in Riverside, where they have ICU sepsis response team who's collecting the samples and also teaching us about, about sepsis. And of course, the work was done by, by um, uh, Shinru and, and Jank 
uh, graduate students and the postdoc in, in our respective labs. So why sepsis? Um, again, in this audience, probably I don't have to explain too much, but but I usually give this talk to people who, who, who see what. Uh, so I'm saying that this is one of the most dangerous conditions almost nobody ever heard of. Uh, it's a life-threatening response to infection. People call it blight poisoning or, or cytokine storm. These are often used as synonyms and I'm trying to tell that it's probably not. The important thing is that it requires rapid diagnosis and treatment. And treatment is mostly symptomatic. Uh, so we're just trying to keep these people alive and hope that they would resolve it on themselves. And, and there's basically very little, almost no direct treatment. And, and uh, what happened in last few years is that the, there started to be massive introduction of the so-called sepsis bundles uh, with streamlined and very fast treatment and it lowered the immediate mortality, but it didn't solve the problem. Uh, it really not treating sepsis, we're just keeping the patients alive. And as a con context of this discussion about long COVID, we also have this long sepsis syndrome where people who went through and recovered from sepsis are still plagued by, by various, uh, treat, various health problems. And there is some argument that what we have done with the sepsis bundles, we have really pushed the mortality farther time in line. So the people are dying, they're not dying in the hospital, they're dying later because the immune system is basically in pieces. <clears throat> so again, why we want to treat it? The obvious thing is that it's the, probably the largest unmet medical need. It's, it has very high mortality, more people die of sepsis than, than breast cancer, prostate cancer and AIDS combined. And yet we don't hear too much about it. So it's, it's a huge unmet need. It's you know, one third of all hospital deaths. There are billions of money spent on treatment of sepsis patients. So it's obviously a huge market and a huge need. Uh, but of course it is not that simple. And uh, there was supposed to be a picture here, which I don't know, oh, there it is. So of course, People have tried. It's not like we are first who thought about treating sepsis. It is called the graveyard of treatments. There are long history of failed clinical trials. As an example here, I can list the series, uh, series debate. And I'm not trying to single out LA Lilly here. I didn't know that HI would be here. So it's not, not a, nothing personal here. It was just an example I was familiar with because at some point in medical school, I was teaching the history of recalled drugs and how they were recalled. So this is just, I was familiar with this. So it's an example of the drug which was approved and later withdrawn uh, because the real life um, testing shown that it was not as useful as possible. And when people worry why, why these failures happen is that the first obvious one is that mice are not people. And most of the drugs have been tested on mice and then it turned out not to work in people. Uh, the second important thing is that this, you know, there's still an open question. Is it just one disease or many? Have we just bundled together multiple diseases under one name and we treat one and, and people, people die from another? And then the big question here is how to catch a dynamic disease, because this is my point, and I would be sort of hammering it all, all along, that it's a, it's a very dynamic disease. So sepsis, you know, in, in the first hour may be a different disease than sepsis next day. And in, and the, in the some simplified way, it's a balance between hyperinflammation and immunos, immunoparalysis. So this Contrary to, to obvious thinking, it happens almost simultaneously. Some, some elements of immune system are exploding, some others are shutting down. So, so when you see this dynamic of sepsis, most people who die early in sepsis, they die because of inflammation and, and organ failure where the own immune system attacks the organs. But most of the people, and then some of them, manage to survive by changing the trajectory and going into recovery. But at the same time, other elements of, element of, of immune system are shutting down. And most of the late deaths happen because of people who are immunosuppressed and they just die of random infections because the immune system is just doesn't really exist. So the issue is how to understand these dynamics. And when we're catching people who arrive in hospitals, you know, in contrast to mice where we caused it, we may not know when this process actually happened and how far along they are in this trajectory. And also we want to worry how to modify the trajectory because most of the work, and I would be showing it later, um, is now focused on diagnosis sepsis, so the, how far along you are in this trajectory. But also the question we can ask is how we can modify the trajectory to actually push down into, into recovery. So in our approach, we, 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 we did several things which I believe uh, differ us from, from what most of the other efforts have been doing. Uh, and this is all published. Uh, this part of it is published. The first part was just 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 appeared a few months ago. Uh, so one thing we did different from many studies is we use single cell because first of this, 
for instance, because of this, we can identify contradictory trends in different immune cell subsets. So when you took bulk sequencing and you're looking at the overall response, when half of the system is going one way, half of the other going the other way, this may cancel each other and you just don't see any signal, but now we can identify individual subsets. We do longitudinal analysis because it's a dynamic process which moves between these opposites. So if you just see what is happening on the onset, you don't know. So we did this in within subject study where we followed the same patients and took at this, at this point two, but we have samples for more uh, points along the, the, the way. And we, we also have patients both who survived and who, who later died. So we can track the trajectory toward death and toward you know, uh, recovery and see how different are these this paths. Uh, we focus on one specific type of sepsis, which is urosepsis uh, caused by uh, urinary tract infection. So we try and, and also we focus at this point in mostly in coli uh, caused one. So, so we try to narrow down this heterogeneity by looking at one specific uh, type of sepsis. Another novelty we introduce is we, we use PBMCs, but we, we separate them by centrifugation, not by what is usually done, uh, which is, which is the, the, the affinity column. So where you do this and you select uh, uh, cells based on, on the receptors they have, you're sort of looking under the, the lamppost because we're only looking at things you expect to find. And one of the interesting results from our approach by we look at centrifugation, we found several groups of cells which shouldn't be there, but they are. So in many other studies and specifically in our competing studies where people will look at single cell, they haven't done this and they simply haven't seen this, this, uh, this, this, this cell. So we see some new groups of cells appear in blood, which, which are not there in healthy people. So, so this is another sort of direction or another aspect of this novelty. Uh, okay, come on. So very shortly, our results. So we, as I mentioned, we have series of survivors and non-survivors in sepsis, and we look at difference between the, the immune status um, T0 and T6, so six hours after first sample was taken. And again, just to cut, you know, cut long story short and, and focus on one specific aspect, we looked initially at biomarkers, and we noticed that there are several of them. We just you know, have a list. We started from the top, and this is what I will be talking about today. We noticed the CD52, is a, is a very strong biomarker, which, which is present and overgrows in survivals and drops in non-survivors. So not only the level of this identifies where you are along the path, but also changes between survivors and non-survivors are very systematic. And we looked at it and we, we discovered that uh, you know, our working hypothesis is that in this case, uh, it identifies subsets of immune cells which are positive, where they help to, to calm the cytokine storm. If these cells die, uh, this, the, the, the other part of the immune system can explode farther. So these are positive groups of cells, which seems to be disappearing from non-survivors and uh, surviving or growing actually in population in survivors. So we found this, this uh, biomarker for survivor. And then it's just an example from a list and we started from the top. We have some other candidates. Uh, we also have uh, so, you know, markers of fatal uh, sepsis, proteins which are strongly upregulated in, in people who did not survive. And also it is an opportunity for me to show the picture from, uh, from, uh, from the single cell analysis, which shows two groups of cells uh, which seem to be specific uh, to sepsis patients. And, and specifically upregulated and overrepresented in, in uh, non-survivors, which are aetroid precursors and platelets. Again, these are typically not included in PBMCs. They are not selected by standard selection procedures. We have seen them because of our approach using centrifugation. They show up, they are strange, and they seem to be an example of, of, of cell types which, which, which only are present in, in disease states. So these are biomarkers. But we started thinking about how to, to take this one and could it be, instead of just a biomarker, could it also be a target? And we, we have realized that, yes, we can actually try to, to, to have a model of why it could be also a target. So our current hypothesis is that the CD52 exists in two states. It could be either attached to the cell or it could be free floating. And part of the process of what we now our current hypothesis is that 
the, the soluble CD52 does harm in two ways. One, when it's cleaved from the cell, the cell gets a signal uh, to die. And second, where it's released, and then it interacts with uh, in globulin like lectins on other cells, it also enhances the process of, of, of the cells to die. So if we stop it, it could bo work both ways. It would decrease the number of soluble CD52, and also it would stop cells which are losing them. So this is a hypothesis we currently have. We have a few other possible targets to, to evaluate, but, but this is our current best, best uh, hypothesis. And what we like to do is to test it, of course, on mice, but we have all the caveats. But another approach we, we believe could be useful and could be used here is to, to look at cell dynamics in patients' blood. blood. We have blood samples, both from healthy patients and from, from sepsis patients in different stages. And we thought that we could you know, use this blood it's frozen in samples and we can, we can revive it and start to see if we can manipulate the balance between different cell types uh, using this, this kind of approach. And of course, we have another challenge. We, we start just thinking and sort of wrapping our head around it is that, that it's a very you know, quickly progressing uh, disease and we, we have to find an approach which would allow us to quickly identify the stage in which the patients are. So, so time to decision must be comparable to the, to the sepsis bundle timing. We, of course, did not want to intervene or change the existing protocol. We just have to put a bit on top of it. So we have to find a way to identify this, this patients who, who, who have this distorted distribution and, and be able to, to act very quickly. So these are sort of two, two challenges here. And again, from this perspective, why we're we giving this talk is we have a plan. Uh, we need resources. There are several things, obvious things to try before we can, we can move to a decision. So we, we, we want to expand the single cell study. At this point, we have only six patients and two time points. We have a database of blood samples. We can expand it. We want to see how well this trend holds and if it's true for all. Uh, we have ready-to-go experiments. We have, we have mouse models of sepsis. We have a bank of frozen blood samples, including sepsis patients in different stages. So this hypothesis can be tested very quickly. And again, we have these testing strategies. We can look at survival mouse models to see if this kind of intervention would actually help and extend uh, and recover mice, which otherwise would die. And also we can look at, at beneficial changes in cell populations in patients' blood. So there are two quick tests. We can evaluate this kind of therapies. And this is my short presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, what I like about this is that it, it, it does look at sepsis as a, as a dynamic disease state and trying to match the right drug to the right time of the disease in, in each patient and looking at patient stratification and um, groupings as, as uh, better treatment options or for guiding better treatment options. I'm curious about, um, not to call on, on any of you two particularly, but Jessica at, um, at Amgen, uh, King and Walter at, at City of Hope, and Mark at Daiichi, if um, any of your experiences uh, have uh, guided you towards a particular perspective in sepsis. There are very few either diagnostics or therapeutics for sepsis. We have maybe AM Pharma and Immune Express or two that I, that I know pretty well. I just, uh, one apology. I just realized I forgot I have one more slide. <laughs> <laughs> so we did very, very preliminary work with what other people are doing. So I would summarize it that obviously we're not alone. It's a very, very interesting space. So a lot of companies are trying to do it. We did a short search and some of this was suggested by, by Julieta and others. So we look at them and basically we still believe we have a unique strategy. So most of the companies, there are many which try to work in this space. They typically, you know, this is a specific analysis we have done, but most of them focus either on two steps, either on, on diagnosis uh, and so they're trying to see where in this process you are, how far along you are, and on solving specific effects of sepsis, mostly in the first uh, immune explosion phase when they try to stop organ failure, which is of course vital. And if it already happens, you want to stop it, but they do not address uh, exactly these questions which, which you pointed out, which dynamic aspect of it and trying to modify trajectories. Because again, one of the big surprises and challenges in sepsis, which we're told by the physicians working in ICU, is that it's difficult to predict outcome from the stage of the patient. Some patients who seem to be very far along and have very strong effects, they survive. Others who seem to be mild, initially they die. 
So this is how we come to this whole idea of, of trajectory being important, not only your starting point. So now this is the last slide. So now, thank you very much, sorry. Thank you for clarifying. About it. Thank you. Adam, maybe just a quick question. Um, in, and there's folks on the um, call here who know this field far better than I do. Um, but for CD52, do you see that in other um, CRS responses? Like, do, do you see that with, with CAR-T or, or other types of um, induced cytokine storms? Is, is that also a, a known marker? It was mentioned in literature a couple of times. It seems to be a weak marker. We see it much stronger because we see it in specific cell populations. So we saw it mentioned in literature. We haven't done this analysis ourselves, but mm -hmm. we did some literature search. And yes, it was mentioned as a marker. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also mentioned in different contexts. There's a drug against it, but this drug works the other way. So it's actually trying to kill the cells which express CD52. So there's a, a market, there's a, uh, you know, a drug on the market which targets uh, CD52 uh, you know, carrying cells. And I understand this was sort of tested in, in several diseases, including multiple sclerosis. It is trying to kill the cells. And the interesting aspect, which also sort of gave us some, some uh, encouragement is that side effects of this drug uh, is sepsis. They have several cases of, of yeah. patients going into sepsis after using the drug. So again, it suggests that really removing this population of cells which this drug is doing uh, is actually enhancing sepsis. So this is also indirect support that's saving this population from, from disappearing or perhaps in, you know, trying, trying to grow it would, would work the opposite direction and stop sepsis. Yeah, Adam, that was gonna be one of my questions for you is you know, are there any insights we can get from the uh, CAMPATH uh, information? Obviously this drug's approved for CLL, multiple sclerosis, um, you know, and, and it, it is, you know, significantly immunosuppressive drug in that it depletes these lymphocytes. Um, but um, is, is there any thought to do some immuno, immune profiling of patients on this drug to try and understand that a little bit better? Again, these are all possible options. Again, all we did at this point is literature search. And as I mentioned, we've been encouraged by mentions and comments about this, one of the side effects of this drug being sepsis. So we are, it tells us we're, we're in the right neighborhood. But, but we haven't directly done this kind of analysis. Maybe I'll follow up real quick. First of all, good to see you again. Adam and I have collaborated in the past on, on lupus I, research. It's great to, so great to see you. So I feel sorry of mentioning yeah. <laughs> the Lily debacle here, but, but sorry. Oh, well, well, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll touch on that. It was before my time at Lilly, but Zygris was a, a pretty prominent story in the in the in the biomedical uh, <laughs> landscape, and, and I, I think main comment I have is it speaks to a large unmet need in in sepsis. That you know a drug was approved on the basis of a single positive trial, but but further work was done um, that would not repeat the result, and the drug was appropriately withdrawn from the market. Um, it really speaks to sort of the complex biology of sepsis, um, but also the complexity of doing clinical trials in the in this disease on this severe end stage disease where there's a lot of heterogeneity between patients and so on so people continue to try and understand what happened with zygris from a um, you know clinical research standpoint um, you know even now decades out um, um, so, so I, you sort of answered the question I was going to ask you about uh, you know the the marketed anti cd52 antibody. One, one interesting thing about sepsis is, you know, coming back to the COVID discussion earlier, there, there is sort of a lot of overlap between sepsis and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And what a lot of these, um, you know, a lot, of, what a, lot, a lot of the more severely ill patients with uh, COVID have experienced over the last That's year. Nice. Any, any sort of thoughts about tapping into, you know, unfortunately COVID has still not gone away and there are still sick patients in hospitals with COVID. Any thoughts about tapping into um, some of that information and seeing if there's some overlap with what you're looking at yes, in sepsis. Of course. Again, I actually I had a slide on it. I removed it because because I timed myself and realized you know I could talk the whole day, but <laughs> I'm trying to constrict myself. So yes, obviously yes. We actually our next paper we're trying to work on now right now is about analogies uh, between between uh, our view of sepsis and COVID patients. We actually found so there's so much 
work now and re research, you know, uh, research on, on COVID, there's actually a lot of new data sets coming up. So we are currently in the process of, of, of finishing a paper about these analogies. So yes, we see a lot of similarities, but there are some specific differences between, between COVID and sepsis. So I wouldn't call completely the, what's happening with COVID patients as sep sepsis, but it definitely has the same elements. And we believe that, again, I would pivot it to Mira because I'm not an immunologist, but we see a lot of analogies in different chronic diseases and effects of chronic viral diseases on neural system, which COVID seems to accelerate. So, so basically in, in weeks, you can get outcomes, which in other viral diseases you see, you have you need years to happen. And we believe that state of immune system may, may have something to do with that. But again, this is one of many unanswered questions here and the data is out there. So in this case, we need time and of course resources. That's a great segue over to Nicole, uh, my fellow UC San Diegan, um, or fellow San Diegan uh, here at UC San Diego. And um, she will talk a bit about modulating, um, being able to uh, affect uh, distributed cancers, metastatic cancers locally through uh, bioengineered viral particles derived from plants. Thank you, Nicole. All right, I think I was still muted. Yeah, so thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to share some of our research here today. So I shortened the title to just uh, say nanoengineering gone viral, hashtag viral. So we, we live in a global pandemic and all of us are thinking about viruses a lot these days, but um, pandemic or not, I'm always thinking about viruses. And I don't think of them so much as a pathogen or infectious disease, but as a tool that we can reprogram to impart new functionalities targeting human health as well as plant health. And the viruses that I think about, the viruses that we work with are plant viruses. Um, conflict of interest statement, I'm also the co-founder of and serve as the acting chief scientific officer for Mosaic Immunoengineering. Uh, Mosaic Immunoengineering has uh, licensed uh, some of the technology that I'm also presenting here today. So plant viruses as nanotechnologies. Um, as nanoengineers or nanomedical engineers, often what we seek to do is to devise a nanocarrier to deliver a cargo to specific cells and tissues. And our approach has been to repurpose biology and use naturally occurring nanomaterials, specifically those from plant viruses. Now, I think there's many good reasons why we've chosen a plant virus-based nanotechnology. Well, first off, these are prefabricated nanoparticles. Uh, we literally harvest them from trees. We literally harvest them from plants. So in the lab setting, uh, we are growing um, a number of different plant viruses and in indoor uh, plant chambers and uh, the, the, that is um, called molecular farming. So we produce the cowpea mosaic virus and black eyed peas. Uh, we also work with a number of other plant viruses that are produced in Australian tobacco. We use the plant virus versus a mammalian virus because um, there's an added layer of safety because these particles are non-infectious towards mammals. It's a very high precision nanomaterial. Essentially, each particle is a clone of each other. So from a quality control and assurance point of view, we have a very high quality assurance built into the system. The technology is scalable, programmable. Uh, we produce them in plants. Each plant essentially is a bioreactor. We need more product. We simply grow more plants. Um, we can purify up to 100 milligrams from just 100 grams of leaf material. It's a medium-sized Ziploc bag full of leaves. We can store them indefinitely at minus 80, purify the product whenever needed. Um, plant viruses are not subject to the cold chain. We can store them uh, at room temperature for, for years and they maintain their structural integrity. And we can engineer them through genetics and chemistry to tailor them for particular applications. Just to briefly give you a flavor of what we are doing in the lab, we have repurposed plant viruses as molecular tools for molecular imaging, focusing on 
um, MRI imaging. We've used them for delivery of therapies such as chemotherapy, protein drugs, nucleic acids. We've engineered plant viruses for as vaccine candidates um, targeting both cancer vaccines, infectious disease. We recently had a publication on a COVID-19 vaccine candidate, uh, not subject to the cold chain, um, as well as uh, cardiovascular vaccines. And we, we are also applying these concepts toward plant health. So given the, the limited time, uh, what I want to do is just highlight one application, and that is the application of a plant virus as a cancer immunotherapy. Nicole, I'd like to briefly mention uh, that you have a colors widget that's that's up and being shared. And it's a little distracting because you have beautiful slides. Okay, on on the top. There we go. Yes, on the top right. Um, there you go. I wonder if it, it's it's something like a. Um, oh. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah. No problem. Um, All right, is that better now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so just to, um, for some of you, I'm sure are familiar with the cancer immunity cycle, so, some may not be, so we'll just briefly go over this. The cancer immunity cycle essentially is uh, our body's defense against uh, tumors and metastatic disease. Right? The tumor cell undergoes cell death, and that happens for all sorts of reasons. They run out of nutrient, they run out of space. Um, innate immune cells now process the contents released from, these, uh, from, the, from this tumor cell. They, they process tumor-associated antigens, new antigens. The innate cells traffic to the lymph nodes where they now engage with the adaptive arm. They program cytotoxic T cells to recognize these signatures, engage and induce cell death. So this is a beautiful system and this, if this would be working flawlessly, metastatic disease wouldn't be a problem. However, um, highly aggressive tumors will shut down the cancer immunity cycle through numerous mechanisms. So what we thought to do is to use a plant virus as a cancer immunotherapy inspired by nature with the idea that we could tickle the immune system and awaken the immune system to turn on again this cancer immunity cycle. And the idea I think is uh, actually quite simple. Plant viruses are not infectious towards mammals. However, they have all the bells and whistles to be recognized by the immune system as foreign. They, they have danger signals and activate the innate immune system. So the idea is we take the plant virus and inject it directly into an identified tumor. This will reprogram the tumor microenvironment, activate the immune system locally, these innate immune cells that are now activated and process tumor-associated antigens will traffic to the lymph nodes, connect with the adaptive arm, and if successful, we reinstate normal immune function. And the beautiful thing is this actually works. So we've demonstrated that the CPMV, which stands for cowpea mosaic virus, and C2 vaccine induces durable systemic anti-tumor immunity. We've demonstrated success of this in numerous mouse models, as well as in canine patients. And I get into the canine patients in a minute. In mouse models, we've shown success in melanoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, and glioma. What's very important to understand here is we're treating locally, but the effects, the treatment efficacy is systemic. Um, here's just one example showing the treatment of a dermal melanoma in a mouse model. After injection, three days later, the tumors essentially collapse. There's no toxicity of the particle itself. If I grow tumor cells in a Petri dish and I add my particles, nothing happens. However, if I grow cancer cells and I add innate immune cells, and then I add the plant viral particle, these innate immune cells get turned on by the plant virus to attack the tumor cells. And that's what we're seeing here, three days post-injection. That's the the, the action of the innate immune cells. So we see good efficacy in this mouse model. If we take the survivors and we keep them for several months and then we re-challenge them with the same disease, the disease doesn't take, these tumors don't take. And this indicates that we have immune memory. Um, 
we, we've also demonstrated efficacy as a solo therapy. So just using the CPME and CT vaccine. We also shown synergy with checkpoint inhibitors, with chemotherapy, with radiation. So just uh, maybe as an example, the top panel, here we're looking at a highly disseminated uh, metastatic mouse model of ovarian tumors. And we treat with CPMV and cowpea mosaic virus in this case at a suboptimal dose. So we still see efficacy, but we don't necessarily see the cures that we could achieve with a higher dose or more frequent administration schedule. And we did this on purpose because we wanted to evaluate whether there's synergy with other treatments. So if we look here with the alpha PD-1, so targeting the checkpoint PD-1, in this model, there's no efficacy of the checkpoint alone. However, when we combine them, we see synergy. And again, the effects are long lasting. Um, similarly, combined with chemotherapy, we see synergy and we also observe the abscopal effect. The abscopal effect means we are treating just the primary tumor locally and we're monitoring efficacy on outgrowth of distant metastatic sites. So by treatment of one tumor locally, we can also see treatment efficacy on distant metastatic sites. Again, highlighting that this is a systemic treatment administered locally. To date, we've treated around 30 companion animals. Um, so dogs are diagnosed with uh, melanomas, with sarcomas, as well as breast cancer or mammary tumors. Um, here's one of our first patients. Uh, this patient came in with a five centimeter large melanoma, was treated using a combination of the VLP and C2 vaccine, so injected directly into the tumor, combined with fractionated uh, radiation. Um, if you look at the images, this was a very large uh, disease burden, a five centimeter large tumor, two weeks after treatment, dramatic reduction in uh, disease burden. However, talking to the vets, if you use radiation alone, the two week, um, the image taken after two weeks would look very similar. However, six months later with radiation alone, typically they see recurrence, they see outgrowth of metastatic disease. Um, with the combination with the CPMV, there's no signs of a tumor, no signs of metastatic disease at six months, and the animal lived for another three years and eventually died due to non-tumor related reasons, um, old age and uh, kidney failure. We've treated more than 30 canine patients to date. There was no apparent side effects um, apart from a, a slight fever for some of the animals, indicating that this is an immunotherapy and it's working. Uh, many animals are alive to date. Um, almost all animals lived for more than 10 months uh, post-treatment. The animals that passed away, passed away due to non-related reasons. Efficacy was observed on the treated tumors as well untreated tumors. We just completed a study in Spain treating uh, dogs with memory tumors. Um, only one tumor was treated and all the tumors were monitored and we saw a very dramatic effect also on the untreated tumors. We demonstrated efficacy as near adjuvant, solo treatment, and combination. Just to, um, without going into all the details of the immunology, but to highlight the mechanism of action. Uh, we delineated that CPMV, cowpea mosaic virus, acts as a TLR agonist. It activates toll-like receptors. Um, these are receptors that are um, highly conserved amongst our mammals. And in particular, we're hitting on three TLRs, TLR2 and 4 triggered by the protein, and TLR7 triggered by the single-stranded RNA that is packaged inside these particles. This essentially activates the innate immune system. Um, sorry, I can't actually see my slide here. Ah, sorry. Let me... Sorry for the technical mess up. Um, so by injecting this locally, we're hitting on the innate immune cells and key players are um, switches in immune cells such as an M2 to M1 macrophage switch. We're activating neutrophils. We're activating and recruiting NK cells, natural killer cells. Some key cytokines that we're seeing are type one interferon, interferon gamma. So these are innate immune cells recruited to the tumor they induce the cell killing. Again, the particle by itself is non-toxic. 
So the cell killing is largely mediated by M1 macrophages, neutrophils, and NK cells. These cells are also tumor antigen uh, presenting cells and make the link to the adaptive immune system. We're seeing um, CD4 and CD8 T cells, including memory cells, explaining the systemic and long lasting efficacy. So to, to come to an end, um, I'd like to thank everybody in my group, um, as well as our funding sources. And I'll be uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, AJ, uh, you and I have both seen a significant amount of uh, investments over the last, I'd say, two years or since 2020 in engineered particles for drug delivery, um, which, you know, very broadly speaking, this, this falls into. Can you tell us a bit about um, Eli Lilly's perspective on that and your, your personal perspective as well? Yeah, I mean, I think this is incredible. First of all, great, great presentation, really cutting edge research and um, touches on so many hot topics in, in, in oncology and, and uh, other forms of research, you know, in terms of uh, manipulating the immune response to tumors and in terms of really novel drug, um, drug delivery vehicles. You know, I, th I think we continue to think about tools to deliver specific therapeutics in oncology and outside of oncology and um, think about new mod modalities where they haven't been used before. I mean, as an example with Lily, we are, uh, even though siRNA therapies have only been thought about sort of in uh, in disease where you can target the liver until now we're thinking about novel approaches to can we deliver specific therapeutics uh, to to individual tissues so I mean I guess um, the potential here is is profound um, you, you I guess uh, understanding more about the these particular plant viral vectors and your ability to target different tissue types would sort of I think broaden it to other therapeutic areas. Um, I, I mean, my, 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 my question would be, you know, so obviously you're looking for the, to, with the injection into the tumor here to, to trigger the immune response via the toll receptor activation. What, what are the potentials for managing that in other diseases? If you were to use some of these vectors for delivering therapeutics, you know, is there a way to sort of, you could think of to manage um, that immune response elsewhere? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So yeah, with regards to yeah, tailoring this for other diseases, um, yeah, I think we are, we, we have an like for lo localized application, of course, uh, solid tumors are the idea application, but there might be other inflammatory diseases um, where triggering um, signaling through TLRs uh, could be beneficial where local administration also is of benefit. Um, with regards to targeting specific uh, tissues or specific cells, uh, we also have a very active arm on um, targeting and re-engineering these particles so they could be administered systemically, either IP or intravenously, to home sp to specific cells and tissues. Um, most recently, we've looked at S100A9, um, which interestingly we, we was mentioned in an earlier talk, so a regulator of inflammation to home to uh, metastatic sites. And uh, yeah, this paper just came out showing that yeah, by IV injection of these particles, we can home to the pre-metastatic niche um, even before tumor cells established there and um, use it as a prophylaxis to prevent outgrowth of metastatic disease. Nicole, I have a question um, and this great presentation and, and really interesting. And what are your thoughts? I'm sure in doing this research, you've looked at other oncolytic viruses and, you know, Amgen has one that is on the market in live. And how do you see this as a differentiated approach from the other approaches? You know, the, the Enlijic is obviously an attenuated herpes virus. This is a plant virus, but in terms of the overall approach, the intratumoral injection and the potential, you know, opportunity to have that generalized immune response so that you're actually being able to affect tumors that weren't directly injected. Um, but it, in terms of an advancement, I, I think it's a great area and I, I date have been saddened by the fact that we haven't seen more great efficacy coming out of these approaches. Yeah, th thank you so much for the question. So I think there's a number of um, differentiators. And to me, one of the key differentiators is the target. Uh, so the oncolytic virus um, um, targets 
tumor cells to lyse them and do cell deaths and create a soup of tumor antigens and then TVEC is engineered to express GMCSF to recruit the innate immune system. Now, in our case, we're, we're not targeting tumor cells. We don't need to interact with tumor cells at all. We, we're taken up by innate immune cells or the plant virus taken up by innate immune cells. And that's a, an advantage because over time for any biologic, you're generating anti-drug antibodies, right? There's going to be a, antibodies against the oncolytic virus. There will be antibodies against the plant virus nanoparticle. Now, the, for the plant virus, these antibodies are non-neutralizing because the particle will get opsonized and targeted into the immune cells even faster. So we have done experiments with naive mice and then mice that we pre-immunized to generate high titers of antibodies against our drug. And in this case, we even see enhanced efficacy. Um, and that can be explained mechanistically. We are, we, we are not targeting tumor cells, we're targeting the innate immune cells. So this I think is like from a mechanism of action point of view, a, 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 a huge differentiator. Um, we are creating tumor cell death, uh, not by the function of the virus, but rather by recruiting the right kinds of immune cells. So neutrophils, natural killer cells. Uh, one thing I might want to point out is um, we've tested a library of plant viruses to date and cowpea mosaic virus is the only one that acts through all three TLRs and the only one that really induces potent anti-tumor efficacy. So there's something unique and a differentiator also for any other plant virus. Um, so you can't just take any immune stimulatory molecule and, and induce um, systemic anti-tumor immunity. Um, a couple of points maybe on the manufacture. So the plant-based manufacturing is very high yielding. Um, right, uh, just 10 plants give us 100 grams of leaf material yielding to 100 milligrams of plant virus. The dogs, um, we've treated with less than one milligram. Um, so just 10 plants could treat uh, 100, 100 patients. Um, the stability is outstanding, so the drug can be stored um, at room temperature. I believe most oncolytic viruses require cold chain for storage and distribution. So there might be some, yeah, just from a CMC side, some advantages as well. Thank you, that's great, thank you. Thanks. I do have a question too, but I don't know if we're running out of time. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, first of all, great talk, Nicole. It was very, uh, very nice. Um, I'm interested by your comment about how the CPMV was the only virus that, that kicked off the right agonistic profile against TLRs. And you're obviously aware, of course, of the, TLR789 agonist programs that exist in the space, some of which are delivered by as a payload by, by an antibody, for example, and some of which are direct injection into the tumor. I'm wondering how or if you know whether this will be differentiated in its mechanistic induction of innate and then presumably adaptive immunity relative to if you target a seven or an eight or a nine or some programs look at both seven and eight. I'm just sort of curious to know what you know about that and if that's a key differentiating point for this program. Yes, um, yeah, I do think there's a differentiation to the other TLR programs and there's a, a couple of key points. Um, so there's small molecules that are injected uh, intratumorally and um, mo most of them just hit on one of the TLRs. In our case, we're hitting on three TLRs. Um, some are small molecules, some are packaged inside a nanoparticle. And I think there's uh, something very unique about having one formulation, one particle hitting on multiple TLRs in the same cell. Um, so I've seen work by others um, where they've used liposomes and they package TLR4 and TLR7 separately or together. And there's synergy by co-delivery. And, um, and, and I think that that makes sense. Now, the, the fact that we have a nanoparticle or virus particle also means we have long tumor retention, uh, which is very important uh, for these molecules to really work efficiently. So some of the small, small molecule programs, I think, suffer from rapid um, washout effects within tumors. Of course, that can be mitigated by packaging into a nanoparticle. But then I think even if you take all three TLRs and package them into a nanoparticle, 
Um, I still believe that our particle would outperform this due to the avidity effect. Um, so we don't have just the, the four, uh, the two, three TLRs packaged inside. We have them naturally presented on, uh, on the protein for TLR two and four on the outside. So we can interface with those TLRs on the cell surface and then TLR seven on the inside. And there's avidity effect because we have a highly symmetrical structure. And there's a lot of evidence in the literature that avidity multivalency plays a great role in uh, receptor clustering and downstream signaling. And um, so some, some of this is uh, hypothesis based and some of this is also active research in the lab. Um, we've all, already demonstrated loading of CPGs into VLPs. Um, plant virus-based VLPs and shown efficacy, but it's not matched with what we're seeing with the CPME nanoparticle. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It is fascinating. I had assumed initially that plant viruses would be great because they were orthogonal to, to the mammalian system, that they would essentially be uh, neutral except for any engineered um, insertion, and yet you've, you've really shown something very different, I think. We have uh, next Wei An Zhao, who is associate professor at the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center and the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center at UC Irvine. And so far, we've had three uh, panelists who have discussed uh, therapeutic approaches, either targets or mechanisms, um, for looking at, uh, at really cancer and the immune system. Uh, but now Wei An will tell us a bit about a companion diagnostic that can be used to promote um, new and existing immune oncology drugs. Way on. Thank you very much, Julia, um, and, and also the organizers for this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so I'm really excited to be here today to share with you um, a new technology uh, in the space of a spatial omics field, um, you know, really for stratified um, cancer care. Um, I also want to disclose as well. So I'm co founder of a company, uh, Aritas, um, so that aims to uh, really commercialize uh, this technology. So they have been uh, you know, a strong partner for this as well. So I, you know, I think for, uh, you know, for this audience, you know, this is something we're just really excited about. Um, uh, just whole uh, immunotherapeutics are about to really transform um, our ability to manage you know, many diseases, uh, you know, especially you know, in cancer. Um, so these are two uh, very high profile examples, you know, Emily, Whitehead, you know, she was treated with CAR-T's. Um, Jimmy Carter was treated um, with this anti-PD-1 antibody. So, um, you know, both of them are, are uh, you know, right now in you know, the long-term remission or being cured, you know, so this is something just super exciting. Uh, but the problem is that there's, there, there's only a very small fraction of patients actually responsive, you know, to these drugs. You know, you know the vast majority of, you know, of people actually um, are not responding. So I think, you know, that is highlighted by this very recent paper um, uh, where um, the, um, they discussed um, and for immunotech point inhibitors, um, you know, in 2018. So that was a study and there's only about 12.5% um, patients are responsive. You know, the vast majority, 87.5 patients are, are simply not responding. Uh, and by the way, so these are uh, um, you know, patients who are already eligible for the treatment, meaning that, you know, they have this, you know, single marker companion test um, to show they are positive for those markers. Um, and, you know, still the vast majority are not responding. So, um, you know, the field basically came to the conclusion now, um, and that is because of this complex heterogeneous tumor immunomarker environment, uh, where you not only have those uh, molecular target, you know, therapeutic target, but also you have, uh, you know, numerous of, uh, um, you know, cell types, um, and they also contribute to, um, you know, this immunosuppressive, you know, sort of environment, but also there's, you know, physical barriers, and there's, you know, spatial organization of these cell types, um, you know, it's all critical. Um, so that's kind of the scientific premise now is, you know, people talk about, well, you know, number one, you need higher plex. So, so, so your companion test should comprise a higher plex panel that, you know, cover some of these key cell players, um, but also the spatial context, you know, really important as well. Um, you know, just like I said, you know, the, the spatial architecture, the, the organization of some of these uh, molecular cellular markers are really critical as well. So that's, you know, really kind of the future um, uh, um, field that 
that we work towards. Um, and you know, I'm very glad to see there have been some uh, recent studies uh, really provide that evidence um, to support that you know thesis I just mentioned. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of this uh, literature, but um, you know, these two studies, for example, have demonstrated you know not only the presence of those you know uh, molecular cellular markers, but also their spatial organization. For example, the distance between T cells and tumor cells are really important uh, to the survival you know of the patients. Um, um, and this is also a very exciting uh, new direction in the field of uh, the so-called tertiary lymphoid structures, you know, which comprise not only T cells, but also B cells. Um, and they show that, um, you know, the TLS are really important um, and uh, are predictive to patient outcomes as well. So, um, so these kind of discoveries um, it, it are, are not possible without revealing the spatial uh, information of the tumor uh, tissues. You know, I think that's you know, really provide very strong evidence um, for that direction. But the problem right now is that the field uh, has been lacking of um, sample and you know, multiplex tools. Uh, and um, so what we have right now in the field is that um, you know, what I uh, think of the two groups you know, on the left is you have this conventional uh, fish or you know IHCs or in the fluorescence. Um, so those are standard you know conventional method for messenger RNA and protein analysis. Um, but the problem is th is they can only analyze a handful of markers, you know, which are limited by the uh, limitation of your fluorescent microscope, you know, the spectral channel separation. Uh, on the right side, you know, these are you know some of the emerging tools uh, you know we heard about uh, that are based on you know, sequential or iterative method where you do like a many round of you know, staining, labeling, you know, imaging, um, or uh, you barcode your tissue and then you couple that you know, with sequencing. Um, so these tools are able to go much higher in terms of uh, multiplexing, but they also are very complicated, you know, time consuming and, 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 and really expensive as well. So again, so I'm not, uh, uh, going to get into the details of some of this uh, current method, um, but I you know, want to point out, you know, this very recent review article, um, you, know, it, you know, that has done a fantastic job in summarizing, you know, some of the ongoing, you know, some of the current tools. So, um, so this is kind of the gap, you know, we try to fill, um, you know, with a new technology, um, you know, we call it um, spectral and fluorescent lifetime uh, microscope you know, imaging spectral flame. Uh, where we're going to multiplex um, by using both uh, spectral and lifetime information, um, but you know, still with a single round of standing imaging, you know, with a single scan, so we can achieve both uh, being sample and also high plex. So that's kind of our goal. So this just you know um, a reiteration of you know the the current method where you could have you know fish probes for messenger RNAs, you could have antibodies for protein targets. Um, but you can only analyze like three or four targets, you know, because your limited separation of color. Um, so what we did here is we simply add uh, the time dimension on the conventional spectral analysis. Um, and this is the so-called uh, lifetime uh, imaging. So fluorescent lifetime um, is, is a measure of the time um, photons, you, you know, spent uh, in the excited state uh, before it, you know, returned to the ground state. Um, and that's an a, a intrinsic property of a, you know, of a fluorophore. Um, so basically, um, simply by multi, uh, by integrating the lifetime, you know, with the spectra here, for example, you, you can have the same color channel, but now you could use uh, three, four different uh, dyes, you know, that differ, uh, that, you know, that are different in the lifetime signature. So you can multiplex that way. So, you know, still using very standard flux imaging, uh, you know, single round of staining uh, and imaging. And now we can really expand, you know, our ability to uh, a few tens or even hundreds of targets um, at a time. So this is our workflow. Um, and you can start with cells or tissues, and this can be FIP tissues or, um, or like fresh frozen tissues. Uh, and then uh, you use the primary uh, probes to label your uh, your messenger RNA targets, um, you know, those are going to be oligos, um, or you can use antibody um, uh, to send your protein targets as well. Um, and you notice here, um, so there is a readout region on the primary uh, sequences uh, with which you can hybridize with the secondary probes. Um, and that's, you know, this is really where you can do a lot of cool uh, chemistry uh, through. 
um, combinatorial labeling to barcode your targets. So once your sample is labeled and then uh, uh, you, you just image, uh, you know, with fluorescence uh, spectral um, and also lifetime imaging as well. So, uh, you know, basically, you know, each pixel will give you both uh, spectral and uh, lifetime uh, signature. Uh, and then we use a, you know, a, a, a phaser analysis to really uh, decode uh, your targets um, uh, from those images. Um, you know, basically we have a, uh, you know, we have a code book where, uh, you know, we could detect, uh, identify and localize your targets, um, you, know, in, you know, in 3D tissues. So this is just an example um, from a, a paper um, that's gonna come out soon from Nature Communications, uh, where in this example, we, uh, you know, we show the templex uh, messenger RNA detection in colon cancer uh, cell line. Um, so, you know, these are the, you know, the name is genes. Uh, uh, one thing you notice here is that, you know, each target is labeled with two different kind of probes. Um, so through a combinatorial labeling approach. Um, so that's really powerful because that's not only allow us to scale up a multiplexing, but also serve as error correction approach because for each target, uh, you know, you know, to be a true target, you know, you have to have two signals appear. Uh, on the same target. Um, so that really allows us to eliminate a lot of non specific binding, you know, false positives and other fluorescence uh, of, of, of tissues as well. So um, panel B and C are uh, composite uh, spectral intensity and lifetime images. Um, you know, D and E are simply uh, network controls where, you know, you, you, you only see a minimum amount of targets. Um, so panel F uh, is the phase analysis where we uh, identify the target, um, and then we create uh, pseudo colors, you know, map back to the tissue, um, so you can have this uh, multiplex analysis. Um, you know, each of these molecules are highlighted here, and you know, quantify them. You, you can reconstruct a three D um, uh, map, um, and you know, we also benchmark with you know, you know, this technology with some other conventional uh, assays. Uh, you know, in this case, in this box sequencing data, uh, you know, they curve it really well. Um, so I'm not going to details and you know this is online already. Um, so uh, you know we can also do uh, patient tissues. Um, in, um, so in this example is a human skin melanoma, FFPE. Um, so very similarly, we uh, uh, you know we label the target um, and you know we go through um, similar analysis as actually earlier. So one of the key advantage of this um, by using lifetime is we can filter out you know lots of the tissue autofluorescence. Um, so that can be a, a key problem for the conventional intensity based analysis. Um, and and now just simply by applying the the, the film filter, we can remove you know lots of autofluorescence. So the only thing I want to mention here is that you can also do the uh, the density maps you know of these uh, targets. Um, Pankas, right? So, so you can actually uh, visualize how they, you know, where they are and how they localize. Um, so, for example, uh, this target uh, polar two A. So that's housekeeping gene. So you can see they're pretty well distributed in you know, on this tissue. Um, by contrast, if you look at this QR uh, sixty seven. Uh, we lose uh, Myung. Oh, I just lost you guys. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> okay. back. Yeah, Thank you for joining again. I been have some, you know, some internet issues. Okay. So how much have you guys heard about these slides? I, sorry, sorry about this. Um, we we were at uh, sort of looking at the different cells that had. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So so this example for for the tissues um, and you know this patient tissues. So one of the advantages, you know, I just mentioned um, is that um, you can, you know, simply by applying the flame filter, the lifetime analysis, you can remove a lot of, you know, tissue autofluorescence, you know, which can be a, a, a key challenge for the conventional intensity analysis as well. Um, so the other thing you could uh, visualize um, is the density maps of these markers. Uh, uh, for example, uh, this marker polar 2A, you know, which is a housekeeping gene, so that's pretty well distributed on this tissue. But um, the other marker, for example, PR, uh, KI 67, you know, which is a cell proliferation and a tumor marker in this case, uh, you can localize, you know, the tumor cells, um, and that could have utilities, you know, in diagnosis and prognosis. Um, 
So, so um, you know, very quick summary. Um, you know, I think our ongoing work is really try to scale this up. Um, you, you know, to thirty plex uh, because you know that's what we think the uh, the sweet zone for our technology um, to really uh, fill that gap I mentioned earlier. Um, and this should cover most, if not all, the companion diagnostic uh, purposes. Um, you know, I you know I showed you for the messenger RNA detection, but our our ongoing work is also expand, you know, for protein analysis as well. Um, so there's a couple of uh, R&D uh, work we, we're, we're doing right now to, um, to improve the, the, the throughput, um, you know, and, and also, you know, large and deep tissue analysis, um, and also machine learning based, um, uh, you know, spatial data visualization. But, you know, one thing I just really want to highlight for this audience is that we're at a point uh, where we're eagerly uh, uh, looking for collaborations um, to, really apply and validate our technology in a biological and clinical setting. Um, and, and we're also very eager to partner with farmers um, to uh, apply this technology um, in therapeutic development you know, for biomarker discovery, validation, and eventually um, the development of companion tests as well. So I'll, I'll, I just you know, want to acknowledge um, uh, also my, uh, my collaborator, uh, co-PI, you know, Dr. Andrew Guatton, um, um, for this project um, and the team members in our labs, uh, my collaborators, um, again, you know, our startup company, Arvitas, um, you know, which got SBR grant recently to uh, support this work. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here and thank you again for the uh, opportunity. Thank you, Ayan. I, I like that everyone that has presented today has really focused on systems biology, looking at it as a whole, looking at its complexity, um, trying to modulate it, change it, use it to our advantage, again, system against system or, or particular nodes against the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at, uh, I'd like, I'd like we're, we're almost at the end here, um, and it's been a really nice uh, chance to get together in a relatively small group and, and discuss some deep topics scientifically. Uh, I would like to hear AJ's perspective on Weyan's talk, um, especially from the tissue specific, organ specific uh, imaging perspective. And if there are any questions from, from our audience, please um, please share them as, as we enter our final 10 minutes. I mean, I'll be quick because I, because I know we're at time, but really amazing technology here and the potential is so broad. It was very uh, it's fascinating to see, uh, uh, you know, the, the role of the tertiary lymphoid structures in the, in the ICI response. And the, those lymphoid structures are, have been implicated in a lot of immunologic diseases. So you could really see the potential for evaluating what's going on in the tissue in a number of um, immunologic diseases. So um, really fascinating stuff. I mean, maybe I'll, if there's any quick questions from the audience, otherwise we'll uh, um, turn it back to Julia Esther. Thank you. I had a quick question. Um, did you develop your platform based on excisional biopsies or core? For, um, sorry, I, I didn't- For catch. the SFPEs? Yeah. For the SFPEs, were these excisional biopsies or were there core biopsies? Uh, the, okay, so this, yeah, so I'm not sure if I you know, can really catch you, but, but we got the tissue samples from the UCI uh, tissue uh, repository. Um, um, did that, did that uh, address your question? Or? Yeah, it sounds like it's excision. I'll just put for thought, I've, I've developed over 15 post-marketed companion diagnostic oh, okay. um, uh, products and at food for thought, it would be great for you guys to evaluate them. I mean, core biopsies, because mostly in phase one, I think everyone here can attest to it, you will not get excisional biopsies. If you're lucky, you get three to four cores and to completely optimize your, your platform for you know um, it, it, practical use. I highly recommend that you also evaluate these in core biopsies because you will gotcha. get differences in sensitivity and specificity, but great talk, thank you. Got you, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So you, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll follow up with you to, uh, to learn more. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, yeah. So you know, one thing I did not mention is that the the tissue preparation and processing is you know is, is really critical for the success of this kind of imaging. And you know, there's a whole bunch of pre analytical variabilities. Uh, uh, you know, I, I did not mention those completely, but but you know, those are really important. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else with, with comments uh, or perspective to share from your unique position in, in corporate America or biotech? 
fantastic. I um, hope that we can all get together again outside of this this small group. Uh, usually LinkedIn is a great forum for, for connecting. I hope that you'll all look for each other there. Um, and I know that um, Steve has shared uh, the speaker's emails. Um, and so please reach out to them anytime with, with questions or interests in, in developer partnerships going forward. It was a pleasure having you all here today and, um, and I look forward to our next one. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.